Executive Investment Counselor in the Consulate General of Pakistan, Los Angeles. And I am thankful to my participants, our participants who have uh, joined us early in the morning. So let's begin the formal proceedings of this webinar. Uh, the purpose of this webinar is to, uh, to give the idea of the US market to the Pakistani companies, especially dealing in the textiles and apparel sector as we are having the Texpo exhibition. So to give you the opening remarks, I would like to introduce, first of all, Mr. Abdul Jabbar Mehman, who is the Consul General of Pakistan here in the Los Angeles. He is the most senior and seasoned diplomat of Pakistan and serving the Pakistan. I think you got muted. Uh, now you can hear me? Yes. yes so, so I would like to introduce Mr. Abdul Jabbar Mehman, the Consul General of Pakistan, oh, to, to give the opening remarks in this webinar, sir. Uh, Jabbar, sir. Thank you very much, Atif. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and assalamu alaikum. Uh, good evening in Pakistan. Uh, first of all, I would like to Thank everyone who's here today and have virtually logged in to the webinar from different time zones. It's highly appreciated. We are holding this webinar in collaboration with Trade Development Authority of Pakistan to explore and how to navigate the US market during this pandemic for increasing the exports of textiles and apparel from Pakistan to the USA. I'm deeply honored and grateful to our respectable panelists, especially from the USA, who have taken time out in the morning, the, in the morning to join us for this webinar. And I'm sure their experiences and insights, which they will share shortly with us, the Pakistani audience, will be very useful for them. Unfortunately, 2020 has proved to be the most challenging year on record for global trade and economy in a century. The COVID-19 pandemic has destroyed hopes for a strong global upturn. Pakistan is also among those countries which has been severely impacted by this pandemic and is continuously struggling to neutralize its impacts on trade. As you all know, the textile has always been one of the most important industries for Pakistan and the United States plays a vital role since it's the major export market for Pakistani textile products. According to the trade data of US government in 2019, the US imported goods worth a US $3.9 billion from Pakistan and US exports to Pakistan is stood to US $2.6 billion. The value added sector of textile constitutes 73% of total exports of Pakistan to the USA. It's heartening to mention here that Pakistan is the third largest exporter of home textiles in the United States. Although we have a strong presence in the US for this industry, but we have to keep in mind that we live in a different time. And now, especially due to COVID-19 pandemic, and we keep seeing shifts in trends, taste and purchasing behavior of the public. E-commerce is one example where we keep seeing, seeing massive growth in changing the way the public deals with their buying habits. Hence, we need to ahead of the curve and consider all factors to keep up with ongoing changes and shifts for the betterment of Pakistan's economy and to successfully compete with our competitors as we have done so far. I would like to, I would also like to add take this opportunity to shine some positive light on Pakistan's first ever virtual tax for 2021. I believe this is a great achievement for the country as, every, as even during the pandemic, Pakistan has shown its resilience that it has the ability to control and tackle the issues facing the economy due to lockdown and exports from Pakistan has been instrumental in keeping the positive momentum going. I'm confident that my trade investment officers have done proactive marketing for this exhibition, and they are able to get many interested US buyers, including our Pakistani American community, for their participation in this web virtual exhibition 
and arranging B to B with meetings to make this even truly successful. Once again, I appreciate everyone who's here for this webinar, and I do believe that this will provide important insights and highlight the factors we need to focus on. I'm sure that our respectable panelists today will enlighten us about supply chain, trains, legal matters, and e-commerce in the US for this industry. Thank you very much and God bless you all. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Mr. Robert uh, Krieger. Uh, he's the president of the Krieger Worldwide uh, uh, Company. Uh, Mr. Robert is responsible for leading four different companies in three countries and Robert has helped uh, his company to gain its reputation as one of the leading provider of global logistics. Uh, Mr. Robert has been actively involved in teaching classes and starting in both export business and taught international trade management at University of California in Los Angeles, and he has taught customs brokerage at California State Universities. Uh, Mr. Robert has given seminars on the apparel industry in Australia, China, Hong Kong, and South Africa, as well as in the USA. And he's a great friend of Pakistan, and I would like to request Mr. Krieger. Uh, sir, to please uh, enlighten uh, the Pakistani audience with your experience. So thank you. Um, good morning and th thank you, Atif. Um, uh, and salam alaikum to our, our, our friends in, in, in Pakistan. Um, and I'd like to thank the Consul General Abdul uh, uh, Jabbar uh, Maimon for putting this, uh, this conference on. It's a great thing. Communication is always good. And uh, um, the way that we solve problems is we communicate. And there's a lot of problems in the su uh, uh, supply chain. Indeed, <clears throat> there's a Chinese proverb that I've been using a lot lately. Called, um, and the Chinese proverb said, these are interesting times we, we, we live in. And indeed, these are challenging times um, in, in the supply chain. In some cases, we've never had these types of problems at all. In other cases, the only times we've had these types of problems have been when there's been lockouts uh, and strikes, uh, um, particularly along the US West Coast. Um, this seems to be um, uh, a situation which is even, even worse because it's almost gridlock. So um, in Pakistan, we know that it's hard to find containers um, and, and equipment. It's also hard to find space on vessels uh, uh, going to the US. And I'll talk about that a little bit later about some of the solutions that uh, I think are, are, are good. Um, so the general supply chain, uh, as, as far as countries go, Pakistan from what I understand is in a lot better shape than many other countries, okay? Um, China particularly in the, in the US. Indeed, yesterday uh, I heard for the first time that uh, uh, one company paid $12,000 to ship a container from Vietnam uh, to the United States, which is just unbelievable, given that the rates were about one sixth of that uh, um, a year ago. So, um, the summarization of the supply chain, uh, a summarization of the supply chain is in crisis. Rates are, as I said, out, uh, out, out, out the roof, um, and uh, the carriers are difficult to deal with, but not impossible. Okay. So, uh, but on top of the increasing rates, um, uh, the quality of the services have, have, have just, uh, um, just declined tr tremendously. Even getting somebody from a steamship line on the phone or an email to answer the, uh, a question is a problem and we need that uh, to happen. So the current situation on the US West Coast is probably the worst in the entire country. Uh, as of last Friday, I saw photos of uh, 38 container vessels waiting to dock uh, in the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. 38 container vessels. These are outside the port, okay? Um, many of these co uh, container ships hold 15,000 20 foot containers or 7,500 uh, 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 40 foot containers. Uh, imagine the, the uh, amount of merchandise on, on, on one container ship. Um, and in, in the Los Angeles Long Beach port, uh, delays are, are averaging almost two weeks. So it takes about a week for a ship to berth and about a week for it to get unloaded. Now, things can go faster and will go faster. And in some cases, things will go slower. And sometimes things go slower complicated by um, 
um, the miscommunication from the steamship lines. Um, but there is a chattis, chassis shor shortage in the ports of Los Angeles. There's no space to unload the ships in some cases. Um, uh, when, there are, when there is space to unload the ships, there's labor, labor shortages and, and uh, uh, that's directly linked to COVID-19, uh, I'm afraid. Um, there's a substantial number of longshoremen that, that uh, have tested positive uh, for COVID. And uh, indeed the union is demanding that they get priorities for, uh, for getting shots. Um, once the cargo is cleared customs and available, uh, the appointment, there's an appointment system in the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, which, which worked pretty good in the past, even during congested times. Now they've totally failed and the ports are, are trying to figure out uh, alternative solutions. So um, on top of that, when the cargo is available, sometimes two or three days after a vessel arrives, if you can't pick it up, um, somebody has to pay what they call demurrage charges. So if, if it's not picked up within a certain number of days at the ports of Los Angeles or Long Beach, uh, demurrage charges are, 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 are incurred. And indeed the port of Los Angeles uh, is, um, is paying a lot of those demurrage charges that it's collecting to the city of Los Angeles, which is very broke. So um, efforts that we've made to fix the, the supply chain in Los Angeles with a, with a particularly the Port of Los Angeles, have been met with um, uh, mostly failure. Long Beach is a little bit uh, better, but it's hard to select a vessel that goes to Long Beach instead of Los Angeles uh, because of the complications in the steamship industry. Basically, in the last uh, uh, decade or so, the steamship lines have consolidated one buying another, buying another. And now there's, there's three large alliances which cover the main, uh, the 10 main steamship companies that uh, uh, that, that the service international ports uh, from the United States. So these, uh, these companies have become difficult to deal with, uh, monopolistic in practices. Um, there's government investigations of uh, the steamship industries occurring in the United States, uh, in China, uh, Korea, and the European Union. But uh, uh, I don't look at uh, uh, those investigations as fixing any of the supply chains. Indeed, one very sensitive topic um, to the United States government is export uh, uh, cargo from the United States. And the United States, as you know, is a big uh, producer of agricultural products, and I'm sure um, Pakistan imports a fair amount of agricultural products from the United States. Um, we handle a lot of uh, almond exports to the Indian subcontinent, and uh, getting container space uh, uh, is difficult. So it's reached now the level where it's made the mainstream media uh, uh, and uh, the U.S. Congress. Uh, uh, I expect uh, to be invited onto a few, few call, phone calls with some congressmen, either in my district or congressmen that I know, uh, to try to get uh, congressional pressure on the steamship lines to, to help alleviate some of these problems and fix the, uh, uh, the supply chain. So once the container is picked up um, uh, out of the port of Los Angeles, whatever the commodity is, in this case apparel, it's delivered to either a distribution center that uh, a U.S. company owns or a third-party logistics company. And uh, uh, so unloading these containers can be a challenge because some of the warehouses uh, have their own issues with finding labor um, and uh, getting them done. But even assuming you can unload it quickly and then return the container, uh, you have to make an appointment to return the container if they don't accept your your container appointment, then you have something called detention, which is another cost of uh, 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 that you have to incur. Somebody has to incur it uh, in order to um, uh, to return that container. Uh, it's it's pretty absurd. So, um, I was interviewed by uh, uh, the California Para News yesterday, uh, and we talked about the supply chain issues. And uh, uh, my only suggestion at this point um, is, if you can avoid the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach uh, with your um, uh, uh, apparel or any shipments, that's a, that's a good thing. Um, the California Apparel News asked me to predict how long um, the congestion will last. Well, not having a crystal ball, um, and I don't have a clue, but uh, I believe that this problem may be linked to um, the opening of travel uh, in the United States and restaurants in the US. It seems as if people 
have who have money uh, allocated for travel um, or uh, entertainment are now buying things. The things seem to be mostly from from China and Vietnam, um, uh, and uh, uh, the there seems to be the the apparel industry in the U.S. is not strong at this point, except probably in basics. And there's only a few retailers uh, that are that are doing really well that uh, that sell apparel. So I say in the apparel business in the U.S., there are mainly two types of companies: those that are selling clothing and those that aren't um, that aren't selling much much clothing. I mean, the supply chain is huge. Uh, um, uh, as the council general suggested earlier, there is a lot of e-commerce. Okay, um, but that e-commerce. Uh, doesn't necessarily go from a factory in Pakistan to, to a U.S. consumer. Although there is a, quite a bit of e-commerce going, going from China and Vietnam directly to consumer through uh, entrepreneurial uh, companies. Uh, and in some cases, those companies have established warehouses in the United, outside of the United States to avoid uh, paying uh, duties. So that's a complicated thing. So when you're selling to um, uh, certain companies, you have to be careful. You have to do due diligence, choose um, the right customers, right agents, 3PLs, forwarders, and, uh, and customs brokers. Now, I just wanted to go over uh, one other thing before I conclude, um, just, uh, just for edification. Um, service from Pakistan to, to, to the U.S., um, there's really U.S. West Coast, East Coast, and Gulf Coast, but I'm going to focus on the West Coast and on the East Coast. So uh, currently published schedules are 27 day transit direct service uh, from uh, Pakistan into, into the ports of uh, New York, New Jersey. Uh, there's a number of carriers that, that, that offer that service. Whereas to the West Coast, we're looking at um, 38 days, 42 days, 40, 44 days. That's just to get to the breakwater, okay? And then it sits. Uh, uh, my good friend Alex could comment about uh, 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 his his cargo and what's been happening with with his cargo, but I think a, a way to be successful here uh, in in the supply chain is to establish a pipeline. And what do I mean by a pipeline? You, you, it's just simple, okay? If you have a flow of, of, of shipments steady, the steamship lines recognize you, the forwarders recognize you. Uh, in some cases, the terminals rec recognize you, uh, the, the, the docks recognize you, the truckers recognize you. Um, and um, uh, it's kind of like mass producing something versus making something one off. So uh, establishing a pipeline to wherever you choose to distribute your merchandise is, 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 is a good idea. But my best guess at this point is that, the, that whatever pipeline that there is or was established to Los Angeles, um, will be broken probably until sometime around uh, the, the late spring or early summer at the best. So um, uh, consult with your freight forwarders and consult with your clients about the needs um, and then um, doing this and having good agents and good partners, uh, you'll be successful uh, in your business. And uh, thank you very much. And I'm, I'll take questions whenever a T feels that I should take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robert. Thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Ms. Sarah Meber. She's the owner and CEO of Boko Girls, a woman entrepreneur. And uh, she got her business degree 23 years ago and went back to get her master's in speech pathology. Uh, she juggles her business, speech therapy, and five children. And I'm extremely thankful to Ms. Sarah, who is on holidays. But she was wonderful in accepting our invitation to speak and share her experiences in the clothing business in the USA. Uh, so, uh, uh, Madam Sara, uh, please kindly, floor is yours. Hey, thank you so much. Um, sorry about the background noise. I am currently in Miami Beach. Um, a winter break with my kids, just trying to multitask, wear many hats. Um, this was very interesting and informative. Robert, thank you for sharing. Um, I actually really learned a lot from listening to you. And um, I found myself commiserating with many of your concerns and things that you were dealing with currently. So just to give a little background, um, my sisters and I started a modest clothing company about five years ago. 
and um, we do uh, our production through a contractor in Los Angeles, and uh, we buy fabrics that are imported, China, from Pakistan, and um, we keep it pretty simple. Um, so we deal directly with the contractor, and we do sampling and production, all within the United States. We have um, imported in the past from India and uh, fully um, constructed garments, not fabric. And uh, as well as with China, we did very little, I would say, from China. Um, but when COVID hit, um, we found ourselves at a loss of what to do with production because the uh, fabric vendors were closed and the contractors were not available. And it definitely, um, you know, led us with some led us with some difficulties that we needed to kind of troubleshoot and pivot, find another way to continue to produce our items so that we could make them available. We are an e-commerce business and uh, we have a very small supply chain. So we basically go straight to our uh, contractor or the factory and um, then we sell it on our website um, and the customer buys directly from us. Um, we have sold a little bit in Amazon uh, in the past, but primarily we have found that our website is um, the best source because we can give the customer service that the customer um, really needs and wants and answer their questions. Um, it's just a little bit more of an intimate relationship and connection, which we found to be very um, effective. I would also say that um, we found ourselves looking for, I said we found ourselves looking for uh, production um, since it was not available. And actually, because we are an e-commerce business, um, our sales have increased tremendously over the pandemic as most people are home and they're looking for things online. And um, we provided the service that was very necessary when all of the malls and um, stores were not available to them. Uh, we also offer a lot of lounge wear and those are things um, items that the consumer has been using um, a lot over the past year so what we did is um, we actually had to find factories in um, overseas um, this is all pretty new to us because in the past we had gone to China and we went to the fairs and we found factories um, and we didn't have really strong relationships with those factories so we researched we found factories um, we did a lot of sampling back and forth and uh, we began production, um, which led us to another challenge um, and that was importing. So the, the taxes and the duties are exorbitant. And I would say in the last six months, I've seen a 50% increase um, in what we're paying to import items um, specifically from China. Um, so much so that we're paying about $6 um, on top of each item for shipping and duties, which is really uh, very, very, very unaffordable for us as a small business. And um, so we did, I would say, I think we brought in about four containers and now we find ourselves as things are starting to open and markets are starting to open, bringing more of our production back to the United States. Um, because number one, it is definitely more cost effective getting rid of the shipping and the duties and the taxes and not having to wait um, for the port and the unloading and all that stuff. Um, also, I would say that um, the markets in LA are opening and production is more available. Um, and that's sort of been our experience thus far. Um, and thank you for having me on. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Madam Sara. Thank you very much for your time and for your wonderful insights. Uh, now, I would like to invite Mr. Sikandar Rashid, he, or also known as Mr. Alex Rashid. He's the president of the Pacific Textile and Sourcing, and his company is involved in the importer, imports and wholesaling of knitwear apparel since 2002 in Los Angeles. Uh, this is primarily to major retailers and national brands in USA, and specialize in building supply chains for core programs from raw materials to finished goods inventory in the US. Uh, they also involve in forecasting, complete supply chain visibility, warehousing, EDI capability, and picking direct to store for weekly uh, shipments. 
thank you, Mr. Alex. Kindly, sir, floor is yours. Sir. Kindly do enlighten us about your experiences, sir. Thank you. Uh, unmute yourself, sir, also. Uh, thank you, Atif. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Councillor General Abdul Jamar Jabbar Mehman and uh, uh, Commercial Councillor Mr. Atif Aziz for the privilege to attend and speak uh, uh, at uh, the Pakistan Texpo and in this webinar. Um, we are uh, importers of uh, basic uh, knitwear apparel, primarily knitwear, from uh, Pakistan and Jordan and at times Egypt. Um, and uh, uh, I sort of wanted to uh, uh, talk about um, um, uh, Pakistani companies, mid, mid to larger companies, having a, a presence in, in Europe and, and, and the United States. I know that a lot of the larger companies uh, already do have that have that presence, but uh, I think that um, middle-sized companies should also look into into doing so, uh, and uh, uh, that can be you know done uh, uh, at three different levels. Uh, you know, for, uh, first uh, can be. Um, uh, uh, just uh, setting up a U.S. company and uh, having um, uh, a customs uh, brokerage partner like uh, Krieger Worldwide, uh, Mr. Robert Krieger, um, and uh, and then just importing and landing the goods and giving that to the customer. I think you open up uh, uh, a whole different segment of uh, U.S. Uh, importers when you, <clears throat> excuse me, land are able to land the goods. And uh, I think that uh, the cost of doing that relatively is is uh, is not much. And I mean, it, it, uh, it uh, the, the benefits are outweigh the cost in a big way. Um, and a second tier would be to um, have a you know set up a company, have an office, and have uh, uh, people independent or uh, or uh, dedicated employees. Um, uh, you know, representing the company and, and representing the product and having samples on hand and, and uh, speaking to, to uh, uh, smaller and, and uh, mid-tier customers here. Um, you know, uh, somebody like uh, Ms. Uh, Francis Harder, who's, who's uh, already doing that for companies in, in Egypt, and I, I believe is, is part of this webinar. Um, so th that would be a second tier. And uh, uh, you know, for ones that are able to do so, a third uh, uh, more, a larger way of doing this would be to come in and, and invest in infrastructure, uh, primarily warehousing. I think a, a warehouse office is very, very important if you want to grow your business in the United States. Um, and uh, you know, on, on that note, I know that uh, Pakistani banks who have branches in the, in the United States uh, are very eager to, to uh, provide um, uh, loans at very good terms, especially to customers that they know or, and or have a relationship with already uh, in Pakistan. Uh, so, so that is, you know, for, uh, for something for, for Pakistani experts to to look into, but I think that just by the the, the nature of the, the the world events and all that, there has uh, always been not always, but in uh, recent years has been a, a hesitation uh, sometimes on part of of uh, U.S. customers to uh, go and. Explore the market in Pakistan. I mean, they will always, uh, you know, on an invitation from a factory that they're working with or hoping to work with, they will always be very open to visiting Pakistan for that. But uh, generally, when I've, um, you know, the shows that we have in uh, in Pakistan, you know, those uh, uh, could stand to have a, 
a larger presence of uh, the actual importing customer from the United States. So in lieu of that, you know, this strategy of having, um, you know, a presence in, in the United States uh, is, uh, I, I think would, would, would pay dividends. I think it's the next step for a country, con uh, a country like Pakistan. And also uh, the opportunity exists today for, for that due to recent uh, complications in relations between, um, between China and the, and the West, primarily the United States and, and Europe as well. And that's what Sarah uh, alluded to earlier. Uh, you know, there are a lot of US customers that are looking for, um, you know, diversification in, in their supply chain and Pakistan is a natural ally there. You know, uh, Pakistan is the fourth largest uh, producer of uh, cotton in the world. We have very, very good cotton, very good hand feel. Um, and um, so, uh, you, you know, the, the, uh, Pakistan's also the largest yarn surplus country in the world, which means that the growth in the apparel sector is, is only natural. Um, and so in, in these times, I, th I think that uh, that opportunity for the country is just wide open. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, and any, any help I can ever provide uh, as far as advice, um, I think there's some, some uh, I'd be happy to, and then I think there are some very, very accomplished people on this panel today that, um, that I think uh, could be and should be used as a resource by Pakistani companies. Uh, again, thank you, Atif, and uh, thank you, Consul General Maiman, for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Sikhanda sir. Thank you very much for your wonderful insight. Uh, Jabbar, sir, you wanted to say something, sir? So, unmute. You know, Atif, I would have really loved to continue until the end of. Uh webinar but uh, i have an, a medical appointment at nine o'clock in angels clinic so i would like to go and thank you very much once again and atif very well done and i'm once again very grateful to all my respectable panelists for joining us early in the morning today thank you very much continue with your proceedings thank you very much bye bye uh, thank you very much Jabbar, sir. Uh, now it's my uh, honor to invite Madam Colleen uh, Winter. Madam Colleen Winter is an American businesswoman and a creator. And uh, she founded Lulu's, a global fashion brand with annual net sales in the hundreds of millions. Uh, she presided as chief executive officer of Lulu's from 1996 till 2020. And during her tenure, she led the transformation of Lulu's from a small vintage shop to a global fashion brand by leading design marketing strategy and e-commerce innovation. Uh, Madam Pauline continues to be extremely passionate about creating great quality product paired with best in class customer experience. She's an expert in brand identity, digital marketing and growth strategy. And I'm sure she will bring a lot of value to this uh, webinar. Madam Corinne, uh, floor is yours, Madam. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, so my name is Colleen. Um, I've actually uh, really enjoyed the virtual expo. I think you've done a great job. Um, I've enjoyed exploring it. I've already had people reach out to me. So uh, great job all around there. Um, I think today I was planning on taking uh, time to give you a little background on Lulu's. Um, and then also I think it's important from a retailer's expect, uh, perspective on what we like when we are starting to work with a vendor and what we expect out of our vendor partnerships. Um, I'm really excited about Pakistan. I do think it's a great um, country and especially as everybody um, is trying to kind of leave China in such a way. I know our, for Lulu's, we were you know, extremely dependent on China and most of our goods um, still come from China. So um, as Sarah mentioned, we're moving a lot of things to the United States, but we're also moving a lot of things to other um, countries and new countries as well. Um, I founded Lulu's uh, 25 years ago. Uh, we're a global fashion brand. Uh, we sell a curated collection of clothing, of shoes, um, and accessories. And like uh, was mentioned in my bio, you know, Lulu's started as a vintage shop, um, you know, in 1996. And I've led the transformation from, uh, you know, selling used clothes to what Lulu's is today. And today, we're, we're we consider ourselves a one-stop shop. 
uh, for on-trend uh, pieces uh, with affordable price points. Um, and that's something that we strive for. Our, our demographic is definitely the millennial and the Gen Z woman. Um, our customer is 27, she's a college graduate. Uh, she's affluent, uh, she's very comfortable with online shopping, which is, which is great for us. Um, it's, it's very important for her to look good both day and night. Um, she's very social media savvy and many of her purchases really are from digitally native brands. And a lot of times, I mean, this happens to me as well. You just stumble across a new brand and the next thing you know, you're buying something. So um, I feel like today's retail landscape has become more and more crowded. Um, it's a very competitive landscape. And every day we work hard at Lulu's um, to differentiate ourselves as a brand um, and to really stand out in the marketplace. Um, and we've done this by really having a unique sense of style. Uh, we really have a strong point of view with everything that we sell. You know, our designs are modern, they're feminine, they're chic, um, they're sophisticated. And we really like to delight our first time customers and repeat customers with better than expected quality of our items. And the quality really comes from our vendors. And so so we really choose vendors that we know have very high quality standards. This is extremely important to us. Um, we love to invest in like superior sewing uh, construction and high end finishes wherever we can. Fit is extremely important to us and, and to our customers as well. So in order to stand out um, in, a, in a very crowded retail landscape, uh, you know, we have taken, you know, great product and paired it with best in class uh, customer experience. Um, so we, we give our customers very customer centric policies like free shipping, free returns. Uh, we work really hard to provide, you know, unparalleled customer service. Um, our customers have access to stylists, uh, fit experts. You know, we have a bridal concierge team. We sell a lot of wedding dresses and bridesmaids dresses, and we will hold your hand and help you really find a dress that's perfect for you and for your bridesmaids. Uh, we ship everything out in chic packaging and shipping materials. And really what I'm trying to convey here is it's really been our mission to give our customers a sense of affordable luxury. Um, so we like to pay attention to all of the details so we can make you know, our customers feel special with every, every purchase. And to do all of this, we have very high expectations um, from our vendor base. Um, and this is something that's really important to us, really strong vendor relations. Uh, we've been profitable since, since year one. Uh, we've created a really lean business model. Um, and this business model has been able to scale as the business has scaled. And we've been able to optimize it for e-commerce because we are, you know, purely online. We are a digitally native um, company. Um, we're also very data-driven. We don't dictate uh, to our customers what they should buy and where. We actually listen to them. So we have have a demand-driven buying model. And we put out a series of tests, about 30 to 40 new items go online every single day. Um, and our goal with these initial tests is a hope of a very large reorder. Um, and because we're testing all the products, this has really helped us minimize fashion risk, trend risk, and inventory risk. Um, and we look for partners that are willing to work for, with us on uh, initial order minimums, because um, sometimes, you know, our initial order quantities can be low. Um, but, you know, we have a ton of data on a SKU after we complete a test. So our reorders can be very large, really based on sales volume and the feedback that we get from our customers. Um, once a test is complete, um, we actually know the sales volume of a particular SKU by day and by month. Um, and that makes us, it makes, gives us a, a, an advantage in ordering because uh, we are, we can make a very calculated um, purchase. Um, we know how many we're going to sell by size and by day um, and by month. We also pay very particular uh, importance to our return rates. Um, returns are very costly for retailers, um, as I'm sure you know, and especially people like us that give free return shipping. So we want to minimize returns wherever we can. And even though a sales um, of a particular SKU might be high on that test, we never will reorder anything with a high return rate. So perfect, perfecting fit um, in the sampling process uh, can greatly reduce return rates. And we look for vendors that have an amazing fit and that pay particular attention to fit. Um, customer reviews help us also return, uh, determine if we should reorder our product or not. Uh, we will not reorder our product with negative reviews and negative reviews left by customers really come down to the quality of the garment. They come down to bad fit 
um, you were going to get a bad review. Um, bad quality of fabric, bad sewing construction also um, helps with bad reviews. So these are the type of things that we look for. Um, and these are the type of um, attributes that we kind of look for when, we, when, we're, when we're looking for new vendors is are they going to pay attention to fit and to quality. You know, we have um, on an annual basis, we're at the hundreds of millions of dollars in wholesale goods, but we don't produce anything ourselves. Uh, so we rely on our factories and we rely on our vendors um, for our success. So we have long-term vendor relationships. We've worked with many of our vendors for over 20 years. A lot of these people, we had babies at the same time and now all of our kids are in college. So um, I totally think that Lulu's success is really down to a strong partnership with our vendors. Uh, we worked with over 400 vendors. Uh, we've built our brand using vendors from all over the world. But as other um, speakers have mentioned, you know, a lot of our goods are made in China. Um, the coronavirus uh, has really made us realize that we need to make a concentrated effort to reduce our reliance on Chinese made goods. Um, and we're actively looking at new countries um, and new partnerships. Um, and we were hurt terribly uh, when China shut down. Um, basically, it turned into kind of a panic. Um, and we're still recuperating, um, but doing a lot better. Um, I wanted to give uh, everybody an idea of what we look for in a new vendor um, because um, we need, you know, certain things that need to happen right away. Um, and we start with tests with a vendor as well. We want to make sure that a vendor is able to sample correctly. We want to make sure that, a, that we, a vendor, can pass our fit inspection, that they deliver on time, that the goods pass, you know, a, you know QA and QC. Um, we want to make sure that a vendor can follow our procedures and our product guidelines. You know, can they barcode? Can they pack and ship with, in, according uh, to our vendor manual? Uh, we ask for an accessible sales rep um, that gets back to us <laughs> with questions and ideas and all of that. Uh, as you know, we have this millennial and these Gen Z uh, consumers, and they are conscious consumers. You know, uh, retail has really changed a lot in the last five years. And so we are really looking for vendor partners who manufacture using ethical and, and fair labor practices. This is something that's extremely important uh, to Lulu's. Uh, the fashion industry is also witnessing a shift in consumer preference towards environment friendly uh, apparel. And there's a trend in sustainable fashion. So we're looking with vendors who um, are, you know, they're, they're are starting to think about these things and they share a lot of these same you know ideals um, as as we do um, so that's something that we're starting to look for more and more we also like a quick uh, factory profile uh, when starting a new relationship and this can include you know the factory volume and capacity per year vendor expertise um, what are the main categories that the vendor specializes in a vendor's financial status is important to us. So a snapshot of financial status is important. A social audit is also important uh, to us. We like to know a vendor's preferred payment terms. Um, we also like to know a vendor shipping source. I and mean, when we heard about logistical problems, which are turning into a little bit of a nightmare um, for everyone. And factory minimums, you know, I talked about how we like to work with low minimums in the beginning, but you know we do adhere to a factory's minimums um, wherever we can. And luckily, we're at the scale that usually we can meet the minimums without a problem. But we need to know the the per style and the per color um, up front. We also like to know average lead times on approved designs, um, and we look for quality um, craftsmanship, like I mentioned. Um, so if we can see an existing line sheet, but also even better than that, really looking at um, previously shipped merchandise styles that were production quality, because sometimes you have a TOP sample that isn't always production quality. Uh, we like to look at development uh, samples as well, and we specifically look for samples where we can look at sewing capabilities and fabric capabilities. Uh, we love a vendor that has a library of fabric swatches. Um, if that's possible, that's always very helpful. Uh, we ask that when a vendor is making something for Lulu's, that is a, it is absolutely exclusive to us and will not be sold to any other apparel company. And we need to work with vendors that we know we can trust. And that trust really establishes long-term re relationships and that's, and that's what we're looking for. Um, so just, I think, just to kind of summarize everything, we look for a vendor that's ability, that has the ability to uh, source good fabric, quick turnaround of samples. We look for short lead times. If there's any time that we can get, um, you know, a second or third run within a season, um, that just is amazing for us. We look for consistent 
uh, fit and quality. So all of these make a really good relationship. Um, and I think that a lot of the things that I've mentioned today are very similar to what other American companies are looking for um, as well. So I hope what I covered has been helpful. I'm willing to answer you know, any questions that you may have. So thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Colleen. You have given us a lot of information and thank you for appreciating this textbook exhibition. I, we are happy that you found it useful. So I request my panelists to bear with us because we, the trade division, has put up two presentations. One has to be delivered by me and one by my colleague. Uh, this is for the Pakistani audience, definitely, and we would like to share whatever information or intelligence we have gathered at what is happening over here on the larger scale. So I would like to share a small presentation uh, for the Pakistani audience. Uh, Share, I'm sharing my screen and I, I am sure everybody can see this thing. So the topic of my presentation of the Consulate Journal of Pakistan Los Angeles presentation for the Pakistani audience during textbook is the rising e-commerce in USA during COVID-19 and opportunities and direct to consumer. I will be very brief and to the point as Ms. Sara and definitely Madam Colleen has also mentioned about the rising e-commerce. Uh, in America, as people are staying at home and ordering online, as I'll share the data with Pakistanis companies, they have to venture into this business in America if they want to capture more uh, share in this textile and uh, apparel business, as Pakistan is one of the largest supplier exporter of these commodities, textile and apparel to the USA. Uh, just to give you the perspective to my panelist also, uh, America is the largest export destination of Pakistan, and 80% of our total export consists of chapter 61, 62, 63, which are textile, apparel, clothing, and home textile. So in this background, uh, what COVID-19 has impacted uh, on the psychology of the U.S. consumer. So uh, this COVID-19 has accelerated the major shift in retail stores as many of the traditional brick and mortar stores have closed down. The online credit has been increasing. The people are buying online credit as this chart shows this one. If you can see the arrow, the online trend is going up uh, uh, as a weekly car transaction. And this online store is dipped April, May, then you can see there's a constant decline in the in-store apparel, uh, in-store visit to the, uh, to the textile or apparel stores here. And then e-commerce sales in the quarter four rose by 45% as compared with the same period in 2019. And they now make up 16% of all US retail sales as the other uh, charts will show. Well, I will, uh, this is the US Census Bureau uh, data, the most authentic and official one, the most latest one, as you can see, the retail e-commerce sales as percent of total quarterly. This is a quarterly wise data. And you can see the constant rise in the e-commerce sales in America. So this is the uncharted territory where Pakistanis companies have to venture into. So uh, this uh, retail, this slide shows that the big retailers like J.C. Penney, Neiman Marcus, Krupp's, and Brook Brothers have filed for bankruptcy, and they are for the restructuring purposes. They are doing different, uh, adopting different business model. And since April 2020, some 5,000 stores in USA were closed, and 680s were open. This charts, this bar chart show. Uh, you the, uh, you the uh, details of these opening and closing of the stores mostly are closing, as you can see the bottom bars, uh, which shows the closing of stores here in the USA. And uh, this is the another very important chart, which I gathered from the digital commerce website. And this is a very important chart, which shows this steep rise in the e-commerce sales versus the total, uh, total retail sales of the year or over year growth. This, this orange one, you can see that people or consumers in USA are more uh, prone to go online for their shopping in the apparel, especially in the textile and apparel sector. Uh, this also chart shows the $861 billion worth of uh, sales were made online, $861 billion. The total market size of USA retail sales is $4 trillion. And $861 billion is going or is being happening through uh, uh, e-commerce channels or multi-channels. I'll show you 
uh, the major e-commerce retailers in USA, everybody knows about Amazon. Then Walmart is coming up. They are competing. They are giving tough competition to Amazon. But currently, Amazon is the leader uh, in the e-commerce sales in America. And the quarter four of 2020, the last quarter, which is also called holiday quarter, Amazon made a sale of whopping 125 billion US dollars in America. So this is the most important aspect uh, for the Pakistani companies because uh, I would only mention that we are also having a pilot project of Amazon. We would like to have the third party seller program for Pakistani companies so they can sell directly to the American consumers. And this chart also taken from the digital commerce website as, uh, gives you the market size or the market share of the big giant companies in America. Amazon is number one, then Walmart is uh, coming up. You can see the 2021 rank Walmart because many of the Pakistanis companies are supplying to Walmart also. And Walmart is also coming up with their own marketplace. So these are the things which we have to focus on, are especially the Pakistanis companies. So what is the 3P third party seller? For example, if the company is based in Pakistan, they can register on their uh, website seller registration program on Amazon or on Walmart, and then they can, after going through the uh, process of approvals, uh, they can create their listings and they can start selling their products. So there are different uh, phenomena in e-commerce about the logistics supply chain management, the fulfillment by Amazon or fulfillment by a merchant. And to cover these things, we will soon have a separate webinar on e-commerce uh, with TDAP so we can discuss more in detail with it. So I'll not take much of the time here in this webinar on this particular subject. So brand is the most important thing. For example, the Pakistan companies have to come up with their own brands so they can, they can uh, get good market capture, they can get the good uh, customer support as Madam uh, colleague has also mentioned in her talk. So there are certain fee structure in, if you sell in Amazon, which is a giant here, for example, if you're professional sellers, you, the monthly fee is $40 per month to maintain your account. And then on every individual selling plan, there are average cost of 99 cents for each item sold. That there is a separate uh, uh, categories of how items are sold, what are the percentage on apparel sector, which we will share later on in our separate webinar. Then there is a shipping fee and MBA fee. If you opt for the fulfillment by Amazon, then you have to pay uh, more fee. It, it is more cost effective, more effective for the supply chain and for the delivery of your product. So uh, to come on the e-commerce, uh, you have to uh, uh, check about your company that whether you are detailed uh, digital shelf presence readiness, are you ready for your uh, presenting your products on a digital level you have to come up with these certain things for example the description of your product the proper images and videos in the white background the customers reviews as madam Lulu's, uh, madam uh, colleen has also mentioned about her companies uh, lulu's and the inventory you are having then the defect orders you have to mention then the enhanced content uh, of your product on these channels uh, then if you want to venture into this, you need to have a one or two persons uh, dealing in your e-commerce sector, in your company's e-commerce department. You have a dedicated team as just mentioned that you have a customer representative who can uh, deal with the queries or issues being raised by, the, uh, uh, by these companies. So these are the things which I'm sure require more attention and more discussions. But just to give you an idea uh, that America is more going towards the omni-channel or e-commerce channels. So I'll stop here and I will invite uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Abraham, he's a marketing officer. Uh, Abraham, please, uh, uh, you start with your uh, uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me just share the presentation first. Can everybody see the presentation? If they can confirm me, please. Yes, I, we can see, Brian. Please continue. Okay. So, uh, hello and good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Abraham. I'm a marketing officer here in the Consulate General of Pakistan, Los Angeles. And uh, today I would like to give you a short presentation uh, about some general insights regarding consumer trends here in the United States, uh, specifically to apparel and e-commerce. 
I believe our commercial counselor has, has already given excellent insights about e-commerce and I will be taking it from here for the apparel sector. So these are the contents we will be focusing on today. I will not be touching on data a lot. I believe our commercial counselor has already done a pretty good job on that. So I shall skip this and directly go to uh, the e-commerce shift. So overall, the e-commerce industry was of course already seeing extensive growth in the pre-pandemic times, uh, but after broad research, uh, it is concluded that the pandemic actually surged the industry and it caused a major shift. And I believe by now we are all very accustomed to this new era. However, what's more noteworthy is that even the most hesitant consumer is making a shift as well. And I'm talking about the consumer who would have never considered shopping outside the brick and water stores for their apparel consumption. Uh, another important factor to note is that the consumer is becoming more aware about online shopping experiences and how it can save them money by getting a better deal uh, compared to traditional stores. Uh, the fourth point I mentioned is incentive. Uh, what this means is that, that the average consumer in the US rely heavily on rolling credit uh, for their shopping and their, uh, and their respective banks through their uh, whatever cards they use now provide many incent incentives to shop online, such as extra cash back or statement credits. For example, uh, Amazon offers its customers an option to use one of the specific cards uh, to redeem a $10 gift card if they spend a certain amount. Uh, moving on to the pre-pandemic consumer behavior, the consumer behavior was actually very different before the pandemic when it comes to apparel. According to the market intelligence we conducted, the consumers preferred going in store for their apparel shopping needs. And the major factor for this was the correct sizing as they like the fact that they could try before buying. And I've heard that many times, especially in departmental stores like Macy's, Nordstrom and Bloomingdale's. Uh, material and durability of the fabric are another factor. And I believe this was also uh, mentioned by Sarah and Colleen. Um, uh, and another factor that consumers were hesitant to buy online due to, uh, uh, for this was intangibility. Uh, Lastly, less hassle is another factor as they would know right and then uh, whether they like the product or not. So the, this is the current consumer behavior in the market. Uh, like I mentioned before, the pandemic actually caused a major shift for e-commerce. And what is more surprising is that the very same hesitant consumer now prefer buying their apparel products online. It's like their opinion about brick and mortar uh, stores changed dramatically. Of course, even this is led by many factors. And the number one is the convenience of buying online. Uh, most of these consumers simply buy these products on their smartphones. I mean, because it's easy, you're sitting on your couch and you can you know, purchase whatever you want. And there's no denying that they can find much more variety uh, than brick and mortar stores while filtering out the products that they need and they don't. I mentioned this before as well, that consumers are becoming much more aware about discounts, deals and incentives and uh, these are also some of the main factors why these consumers not prefer e-commerce platforms. Lastly, and obviously it's simply time efficient as they do not actually have to physically go to another location to get what they need, then they can literally buy whatever they want in just one place. Uh, the platforms. So I think everybody knows Amazon is probably the number one choice for most of these individuals. Uh, and this is mainly uh, due to the Amazon's uh, recent service called Amazon Wardrobe, uh, which allows these consumers to try their apparel products for seven days, and then they can decide which ones to keep and which ones to send back. On the other hand, while this is the major platform for these consumers to buy their clothing from, uh, the second best alternative still remains the e-commerce platforms of those respective departmental stores, Macy's, Nordstrom, Bloomingdale's, and many others. And of course, the e-commerce uh, platforms of the brands themselves, like Lulu's, uh, Cole Haan's, uh, and uh, Banana Republic, because they already have established online sh shopping platforms now. Uh, another uh, interesting finds that I personally found was that uh, Shop Shopify stores are also on the rise. And this has mainly been done through social media apps like Instagram, where people are seeing more relative ads and are being 
introduced to different brands created on Shopify. And a lot of people are being introduced on that and people just click on it, they find a new brand. And I don't wanna go into the details how Shopify actually works, but uh, this is something new that I've been seeing uh, in the last year. So that will be all from my side today. Thank you for all your time and I will pass it on to our commercial counselor out there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ibrahim, can you stop sharing the screen? Uh, yes. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, to all our respectable panelists. Now, Mr. Asad from TDAP, uh, can you uh, open the floor for questions from the participants from Pakistan so our panelists could respond to that? Asad? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, floor is open for question and answer sessions. Uh, everyone can ask questions. Yes. So I would I would request the respectable participants from Pakistan. So first, if they can introduce uh, themselves, uh, their name and the company name, and if they want to ask a particular panelist to respond, or they could ask a general question, then anybody could respond to that. So yes, Asad, please see who is there to ask. Sir, I think no questions, sir. No questions. People are sleeping in Pakistan. It must be 10 p.m. night time. Yes, sir. yes, it's 10 p.m. <laughs> okay, no question. Then I would request uh, then Mr. Basit Rao, who's the director general of uh, Texpo, uh, who uh, has done a wonderful job, uh, Mr. Basit and his team in putting up this virtual trade uh, exhibition for the first time in the history of TDAP in Pakistan. So I would request Mr. Basit Rao to give some concluding remarks so they can we'll wrap things up here in Los Angeles because all our panelists have to do a lot of work uh, here in LA. So Basit sir, please sir. Uh, for yes, your uh, I'm audible. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Atif, for giving me this chance. And uh, it's a really wonderful webinar, especially I think uh, the other exporters have been get the useful information about the e-commerce, how the e-commerce is going in America. And then Mr. Colleen, uh, Ms. Colleen has given very wonderful information how the vendors can develop the business uh, with the American companies. And the basic reason of this webinar was to interact with the, to create a, a interaction between the exporters of uh, uh, apparel and garments and the home textiles and with the US buyers. And uh, I think the, our commercial section in Los, uh, Los Angeles has done a wonderful job. Uh, in uh, in organizing this webinar and creating a connection between the buyers and the exporters of both sides. And I hope this webinar will uh, give a, a future uh, uh, course of action so that the, the business can be increased with this. And I hope the, the, the visitors from the America or, or the buyers from the America have definitely visited about this uh, Texco uh, uh, the virtual, the first virtual textile exhibition. Uh, the, the basic reason was that uh, the, the uh, was the pandemic that the uh, our export has not been able to go to the America and other European countries to have the business in in the textile uh, in the textile sector. So the TDFP was thinking that uh, almost uh, a year has passed and uh, there should be uh, some effort to connect the. Uh, the, our, our exporters with international buyers and uh, and holding these webinars also uh, one of the reasons that the uh, our uh, exporters get a useful information. So uh, I really appreciate uh, Mr. Atif and uh, the Consul General and uh, your team that they have organized this webinar. With this, I am really grateful to you and thank you very much for this. Uh, thank you very much, Basit, sir. We are here to help our Pakistani companies. I'm especially thankful to our respectable panelists, Mr. Robert Rigger, Madam Colleen Winter, Ms. Sara Mehbak, and Mr. Sikandar Rashid, who find time to this webinar and share their experiences uh, with us. And uh, we will definitely continue to seek their guidance if we receive any sort of query from Pakistan. So thank you to all of you for joining for this webinar and we are grateful to you, madam. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.